Our scripture lesson is from 1 Samuel chapter 1, verses 9 through 11, and chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. After they had eaten and drunk at Shiloh, Hannah rose and presented herself before the Lord. Now Eli the priest was sitting on the seat beside the torque post of the temple of the Lord. She was deeply distressed and prayed to the Lord and wept bitterly. She made this vow, O Lord of hosts, if only you will look on the misery of your servant and remember me, and not forget your servant, but will give to your servant a male child, then I will set him before you as a Nazarite until the day of his death. He shall drink neither wine nor intoxicants, and no razor shall touch his head. They rose early in the morning and worshipped before the Lord. Then they went back to their house at Ramah. Elkanah knew his wife Hannah, and the Lord remembered her. In due time, Hannah conceived and bore a son. She named him Samuel, for she said, I have asked him of the Lord. Hannah prayed and said, My heart exults in the Lord. My strength is exalted in my God. My mouth derides my enemies because I rejoice in my victory. There is no holy one like the Lord, no one besides you. There is no rock like our God. Talk no more so very proudly. Let our arrogance come from your mouth. For the Lord is a God of knowledge, and by him actions are weighed. The bows of the mighty are broken, but the feeble gird on strength. Those who were full have hired themselves out for bread, but those who were hungry are fat with spoil. The barren has borne seven, but she who has many children is forlorn. The Lord kills and brings to life. He brings down to Sheol and raises up. The Lord makes poor and makes rich. He brings low and he exalts. He raises up the poor from the dust. He lifts the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with princes and inherit a seat of honor. For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's, and on them he has set the world. He will guard the feet of his faithful ones, but the wicked shall be cut off in darkness. For not by might does one prevail. The Lord, his adversaries shall be shattered. The Most High will thunder in heaven. The Lord will judge the end of the earth. He will give strength to his king and exalt the power of his anointed. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you very much, Emma. Let us pray. Holy God, by your grace and mercy, may these words I'm about to speak point back to your word just read and to the word made flesh in Jesus the Christ. For it is in his precious name that we pray. Amen. Does God care for those who are in need? When you look at the story of your own life and when you open the morning newspaper or read through your news feed filled with stories of the devastation caused by hurricanes, wars, division and chaos and unrest, stories of the uncertainty and anxiousness that is present in our nation and our world. How would you answer? I was sincerely tempted this week that instead of me preaching a sermon on this theme that I set up two microphones in the front of our sanctuary and invite anyone who wanted to to come forward and do so forming two lines. And on the one side would be those sharing stories or bearing witness to ways that God has indeed shown up and been present and cared for them in moments of need in their life. And on the other side, those who are not so sure, those for whom God has appeared less involved or altogether absent. And so how would you answer the question in your life, in this time that we live in, does God care for those who are in need? Is God faithful to them? 
Does God meet them in their point of pain or struggle or loss? Or does God not? We continue our journey through the Old Testament, the story of God's covenant with God's people, the story of God's love for God's people, and the inconsistency with which we love God in return. We're in the first book of Samuel that Emma just read so beautifully for us, the story of Hannah, a woman who longs to have a child, a woman who calls out to God in prayer, asking for deliverance from what appears to be her infertility, that the great joy and fulfillment that she yearns for might be hers. As the text puts it, she is deeply distressed. She prays to the Lord. She weeps bitterly. It's important to keep in mind the cultural context of ancient Israel in which this story took place and was written. Motherhood was assumed to be a crucial part of a woman's identity. And to have no children had a profoundly negative effect on a woman's social status and her overall well-being. In that culture, it was assumed that the woman was the source of the infertility, whether that was true or not. And it was assumed that God is the one who grants and withholds fertility. And so Hannah comes to the sanctuary in Shiloh to make a vow to the Lord that if she is granted a child, she will dedicate the child to God as a Nazarite. Nazarites were those who lived a consecrated life unto God, either through the vows that they took or the vows that their parents took on their behalf. Picture in our time a monk or a nun living in a monastery, their entire life devoted to prayer and growing in holiness and serving God. Now, our reading this morning did not include a brief section when Hannah comes to the temple and makes this plea, and the priest Eli, the religious authority, the one with power, how he belittles her, is dismissive of her and disregards her. Yet God is faithful. God gives her the child that she has so longed for. And sometime later, she returns to the temple to dedicate the child to the Lord. And she offers a song, a hymn of praise, bringing glory to God for God's goodness, God's love, expressing gratitude that God cared for her in her need. She prays, there is no holy one like the Lord, no one besides you. There is no rock like our God. And so I wonder, has your experience been similar to Hannah's? Has God been faithful? Has God's love and care and mercy been revealed to you? Has it been made real for you? Or more often, have your prayers been unanswered? Have there been moments where God's presence has been harder to see and to feel? There are just two brief observations I want to make. The first is that God does not always answer our prayers in the exact timing that we would like and in the exact way that we would like and with the complete clarity that we would like. But God answers our prayers with faithfulness and love and attentiveness. God answers them. If you are in a time right now of distress or bitterness or doubt, as Hannah was, know that your story is still unfolding. The blessings that God has in store for you have not yet 
all been revealed. There's more that is to come. Even if God has not answered your prayer yet or answered it in the exact way that you yearn for it to be answered, it does not mean that God has forgotten or forsaken you. God is still faithful. God is still with you. God is still present and at work in your life. The second observation I want to make is that oftentimes God uses other people to embody his love and answer our prayers. Oftentimes God uses other people to embody his love and to answer our prayers. I'm sure many of you remember the old story of the person praying for rescue from the rising floodwaters. A state trooper came to his house, knocked on the door, said, listen, I, I need to take you out of here. He said, I'm going to be just fine. God will rescue me. And the waters continue to rise. The, the, risk and, and danger increases, a boat comes along and says the same thing. Fella, you need to jump in. You need to let us take you. And he said, no, God will rescue me. The waters continue to rise. At this point, he's on the roof of the house. A helicopter comes down, shouting out, screaming to him to jump on board. And he says, no, God will rescue me. And the flood waters continue to rise and he dies in the flood. And he meets the Lord at the pearly gates and he says, God, why did you forsake me? Why did you not answer me when I called? And God looked at him with love and said, my child, who in the world do you think sent that state trooper and that boat and that helicopter? The deacon showing up with a meal, the friend reaching out with a phone call, the neighbor offering a caring ear when it was not expected, is God caring for us in our moment of need? Because oftentimes God uses other people to carry out his acts of mercy and healing and love. God uses imperfect vessels like you and me. And so... Might the outward focused serving our neighbor, loving our brother and sister in need ministry of our beloved church be God literally answering the prayer of someone in need? Let that sink in for a moment. We get to be used by God to answer someone's prayer. Answer their cry for help. Bring hope to that part of their life that is still hurting or struggling or in some other way in need. When we send a mission trip to Mexico to build a cinder block home, start to finish in one week. When we purchase the supplies for 40 or 50 or 100 cleanup buckets to, or pay for a truck filled with fresh water to go to Western North Carolina. When we feed hundreds of people each month through the ministry of God's co-op food pantry or provide a safe and warm and dry place to spend the night for residents of home who otherwise would have no home at all when we extend welcome and kindness to a person who feels marginalized or broken or unworthy, when we shine a light on injustice or some other difficulty in our community or our world and work toward solutions, when we provide a safe and welcoming harbor for children and youth dealing with so many social and academic expectations and who at their core simply yearn to be known and loved and to belong. When we do those kinds of things, and by God's goodness and grace, we do all of them here at BRPC. When we do them, God is using us for God to care for those who are in need. 
God is using us to answer their prayers. In the New Testament, the Apostle Peter reminds us that we are to cast our cares on the Lord because he cares for us. That's how Peter puts it. Jesus tells us that we're not to be anxious about anything, whatever is burdening or distressing us, because God knows what we need and will provide. When we pray in the Lord's Prayer, give us this day our daily bread. It's a statement of faith in the God who meets us at our moment of need, that place where we are hurting or troubled or in need of help. And for many of us, it's easier to help someone else to be the giver of help than it is to be the receiver of help. But there come those times in all of our lives where we too are in need of receiving, receiving support, receiving encouragement, receiving God's love through the love and the help of another. And I close with this. Mary Catherine Robinson is the pastor of the Black Mountain Presbyterian Church right in the heart of the devastation outside of Asheville, North Carolina. I can only imagine all that that faith community has experienced and witnessed in these recent days. Well, in her sermon last Sunday, she said this. There are truly no words to describe the horror, the terror of what has occurred over the past 12 days. We have seen the power of our natural world unleash her mighty waters upon our Swannanoa Valley with an unrestrained force and relentless beating. The shock, the loss of lives would still go unaccounted for, the smell of death and mold setting in, the despair. This all leaves me speechless. What I have seen in response to this pain, tragedy, loss, and grief has been beauty. The absolute beauty and resilience of God's creation. Neighbors helping neighbors. Animals providing comfort to those, to those hurting and in need of a furry hug. The courage and finest bravery of our first responders in our community. The outpouring of love from our oldest to our youngest. The nourishing food strangers who are now friends have cooked. It is truly the beauty of the human spirit which leaves me the most speechless. We will rebuild, we will repair, we will persevere, we will hope. We will love the world God so desperately loves. I'm so moved by her faith and courage, and especially her words. We will love the world that God so desperately loves. And so, friends, what do you think? Does God care for those who are in need? If you were completely unfiltered and honest, how would you answer it? I don't have all the answers, but this I do know. Though God does not always answer our prayers in the exact timing that we would like and in the exact way that we would like and with the crystal clarity that we would like, God answers our prayers with faithfulness and love and attentiveness. God answers them. And oftentimes, God uses other people to answer our prayers and embody his love. And not only that, but we get to be used by God to answer someone else's prayer 
answer their cry for help, bring hope to that part of their life that is hurting or struggling or in some other way in need. We get to love the world that God so desperately loves. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen.